folks, this is Pastor Mike Hargrid coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. This will be our last installment on the series that we're doing on the body, the temple, the dwelling place of God. Literally, that our body, this thing that God made for us, literally is the very dwelling place of God, the house of God. Where do we get that from? We get it right from the scriptures. We're going to go back to our text, and then we're going, to, we're going to end up in Revelation 4. And you can turn there, and I promise you, if you have not, if you have not already seen this, if you've not heard this, okay, you'll rejoice. When I shared what I'm going to share with you today, when I shared that with the people of Kenya, um, they shouted. They rejoiced. They got happy. Because here are some of the, in some cases, these are some, some poor people, some of the poorest people in the world. And yet God had made them rich by the abundance of his blessings and his grace and the knowledge that God had created even them to be the very dwelling place that he desires to live in. Let's get in our Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. First Corinthians six nineteen. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Now remember, First Corinthians is the 46th book of your Bible. If you start from Genesis, go to 1 Corinthians 46. Now, I didn't do that. I didn't manipulate that. Man did not put it together in such a fashion. I believe that God did because in the wilderness tabernacle, you had the boards that made the sanctuary, 20 down the south, 20 down the north side, six across the back, 46. It's the number of, and inside of those 46 boards was the book of the law, this rolled up DNA scroll just like in the 46 chromosomes where your DNA is rolled up like a scroll and stored in those 46 chromosomes. Here you have Solomon's temple. Two pillars on the front porch of this, both 23 cubits tall. That's 46. You have um, Herod's temple that was rebuilt. And in Jesus' day, in, in the book of John, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. And they gasped. Oh, are you crazy? It took 40 and 6 years to build this temple. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, that's the number of chromosomes. That's the number for our body, the number 46. And here we have the 46th book of the Bible telling us that our body is the temple of God. And what we've been seeing in this series is how each individual cell represents the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness. You have the cell membrane, you have... We'll look at that in a little bit. But anyway, literally in every sense of the definition of the word temple of God, we are built to be the temple of God, built by God himself. Second Corinthians chapter 5, notice this, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. And think about it. Moses' tabernacle... Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, they're all gone. None of them exist. They have all been destroyed. There is going to be another temple, a temple not made with the hands of man. That's the temple that Christ himself is going to dwell in. And we are that temple, a building not made with hands. Let's go back and look at what we've been seeing. Here is the wilderness tabernacle. 
You have the wall around the tabernacle, which is the cell membrane. You have the mitochondria, which is the altar. You have the chromosomes represented by the 46 boards that make the sanctuary. And then inside that sanctuary, you have the nucleus. And in that nucleus, that's where the Ark of the Covenant is. That's where the throne is. That's where the pillar of cloud was by day, pillar of fire by night. And that is where you have the DNA, the book of the law, rolled up like a scroll. So literally, I mean, we are the very temple, the very tabernacle of God. We are the dwelling place of Almighty God. Now, here's, here's my favorite part of this. This is what I was able to, on two different occasions, to show the people of Kenya. Uh, I look forward to going back someday and be able to share with them uh, new things that God has shown me from His Word concerning our bodies, the book that God wrote, the DNA, and so on. And I just, I love talking about this. Here's my favorite part out of all of this. Revelation chapter 4. Let's, let's read it now. Let's go to our Bibles and let's read it. And then what we'll do is we'll break down each and everything that John is allowed to see when he is carried by the Spirit into heaven and he sees the very dwelling place of God in heaven. And remember, the, the temple of God in heaven must match the temple of God on the earth. And it does. So let's look at it. Revelation chapter 4 verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. By the way, let's stop right here. I know who that one is, all right? I know who that is. And if you have a King James Bible, you know who it is too. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. He says, I see one sat on the throne. I'll just throw this in. The modern translations do not have 1 John 5, 7. NIV doesn't have it in there. It just takes it out. Omits it completely where it says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They just took it out. Incidentally, the NIV apparently does not know who sits on the throne in heaven because where the King James says one sat on the throne, the NIV says someone was sitting on it. And I'm like, okay, we're supposed to believe that John was in heaven looking at the very throne of God and was going, who's that? Someone's, someone's sitting there. Does anybody know who that is? King James. Anyway. Verse 3, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne. Remember what Ezekiel said, that's the glory of the Lord. Don't forget that. There's a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. The third beast had the face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at what John saw in heaven. We're going to break this down. Now, we've been looking at... Um, these individual cells of our body and we're seeing the wilderness tabernacle and so on. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at the body itself, what God has made for us. My body is like my wife's body. It's like my children's body. We're all like Adam's body. And so as far as the things that I'm going to show you, there really is 
no significant difference between our bodies. They are all made the same. They're made from, I like this, they're made from the same blueprint. All come from the same DNA, which was Adam's, which is the book that God wrote inside of him. So let's, let's break this down piece by piece. Here a little, there a little. We'll compare spiritual things with spiritual things. We'll let God give us some amazing wisdom. All right? Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And then in verse 6, before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at this throne and we're going to look at the four beasts. Uh, anytime you see number four, you always think of a couple of things. Number one, the spiritual realm. Um, Jerusalem above is a city built four square. It is a spiritual city. Uh, let's see here. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. And you also think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'll do it like this here. Uh, here's our DNA model, and it is two rungs. They represent the Old and New Testament, and they are joined together by four base pairs, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thiamine. So you think of the Old Testament is linked together with the New Testament by way of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's how it works. So anytime you see the number four, that's what you think of. So we're looking at the throne in heaven, and is there a throne in our bodies related to the number four? 2 Corinthians 1, verse 22 who have sealed, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Think about it. Second Corinthians 3, 3, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. Now stop right here. He's telling you that you have something written. Now remember, the tabernacle and the temple in the most holy place, they have a place where the book of the law is stored, the scroll, the written word of God. In the nucleus of your cells, you have your DNA book written in there. That matches the book that Moses wrote that's in the most holy place. However, now we're expanding, we're broadening out. Other than just the little cells, we're looking at the entire body. And the Bible's telling you that there is yet a book of the law. There is a book written that exists or resides within us, and it specifically says that it exists in our hearts. Our hearts, I like this are actually divided in half. One half brings in the blood, sends the blood out to the lungs. The other half receives the blood from the lungs and sends it out to the body. All right? Four different chambers that make up the two halves and join, join together the two halves of your heart, I just, I love this. And that's where the book of the law is contained. Let me read that again. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. Second Corinthians 4, 6, For God who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful. So the Bible's telling you what the throne is, where the Ark of the Covenant is. It's your heart. God, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That your heart is the throne of God. And it has four chambers. 
Take a look at this. Revelation 4, 2, I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven. Revelation 4, 6, and before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Take a look at this picture. You have the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, the left ventricle. One half pulls blood in from the body, sends it to the lungs. The other half pulls it from the lungs and sends it out to the body. One, two, three, four chambers that correspond to the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that connect this half of your Bible with this half of your Bible, just like in the DNA book where this strand of DNA and, or RNA and this strand are joined together by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. I see, I just, I love this stuff, all right? But then he mentions a sea of glass. What could he be talking about there? Notice that he uses the word sea, S-E-A, an ocean. What's the difference between an ocean and a lake? Ocean is, or a sea, is salt water, all right? Lake is fresh water. Take a look at this. Your heart is surrounded by a sac that contains what's called pericardial fluid. The sac, of course, is called the pericardium. Those are like two Greek words. Peri means around. Cardium is the Greek word cardia, which means heart. So look at Revelation 4. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass, a sea. The pericardium surrounds the throne of God, and it is full of pericardial liquid, which, by the way, is of the same salinity factor as the ocean is. Your pericardium is not just full of fluid. It's full of seawater. Literally, and of course, it's functional. The pericardium serves to protect the heart because fluid is a pretty good shock absorber. And anytime the body, like if you fall or you're hit or something like that, within reason, the pericardium in that sack full of water kind of shields the heart from damage by absorbing the vibrations of some sort of injury to the body. Now, it can't do it, you know, all the way, but that's what is there. So what it is functional, but it is also spiritual because just as the throne of God in heaven with those four living creatures is surrounded by a sea of glass, so is the four chamber heart surrounded by a sea of ocean water, just like crystal, that surrounds the throne of God in heaven. I can remember the first time I saw this, I just went, that is absolutely amazing. I, I, I never really thought of this before. I never really understood this. Now when I look at it, every time I think about it, I get goosebumps on the back of my neck. Just because I realize there is no way in the world that these people 2,000, 3,000 years ago who wrote the Bible had any of this kind of knowledge whatsoever. And yet, there it is right there plainly in your Bible, and it corresponds to this body temple. Ezekiel saw the same thing. Watch this. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance, and they had the likeness of a man. And verse 22, And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal, Stretch forth above their heads above. In verse 26, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And, a, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Now here's what's interesting. We have in Ezekiel 1, we have, uh, we have the four living creatures, the four beasts, which are four cherubs, and over them is this firmament called the sea of glass, clear as crystal. Ezekiel described it as a crystal. Then you have a throne, and then you have a man sitting, or the likeness of a man sitting on that throne. John describes it as one sitting on the throne. So we know that it's something other than, here we go, a beast sitting on the throne. 
because we know also, in, in this beautiful analogy that God has given us, telling us that we're the temple of God and we're looking at our bodies and we're going, yeah, it's built just like the temple of God is in heaven. We also know that there is someone else who wants to sit on that throne. Uh, Ezekiel 28, I am, a, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, it says. 2 Thessalonians 2, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, referring to the beast. The beast wants to be the one sitting on the throne instead of the son of man or the likeness of man, God himself. That kind of brings into question then the idea of what is it that will defile the temple of God in that day. It's very interesting. But anyway, watch this. In the Old Testament, see, what's on earth matches what's in heaven. In the Old Testament, you had the Ark of the Covenant that Moses built. And God told Moses, now Moses, we can't just carry or transport this Ark of the Covenant, any way that we want to. I'm going to be very specific about how this Ark is to be carried forth and to go from one place to the next. And God said, I want you to put rings in the Ark, and I want you to put two staves in there, which the word stave means a staff, two poles, two rods. Think about it, okay? The number two always represents double witness. Old Testament, New Testament. That's what the two staves are. They represent the Old and the New Testament. All right? They um, also, because there was two staves on each side and going through the rings that were carrying it, of necessity, there were four Levite priests you see a picture of it here that carried the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. And God said, there's not to be any other way that that Ark is to be moved or transported but by the priest carrying it by the staves. No other way. Now think of what those four Levite priests represent. We know up in heaven there were four living creatures. We see it in Ezekiel. We saw it in John chapter 4. So those four Levite priests, those four living creatures were of the priesthood of Melchizedek. Their job was to carry about and transport the very throne of God. The Bible says that the chariots of God are 10,000, even thousands of angels. So it's no wonder that we have a match on earth like we do in heaven. We have four living creatures that are transporting the very throne of God. So four living creatures, four Levite priests, and here's the analogy of it. Because the ark, which represented, number one, God's throne, number two, represented God's mercy. Because the blood of the Lamb was sprinkled upon the mercy seat as a token of the covenant of God's salvation. The Bible is basically telling you in that typology that God's salvation and God's mercy and God living and reigning inside of our lives and hearts should never come about but by four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you remember when David wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem? Because he wanted to build the temple. So he sent for the Ark of the Covenant. They put the Ark of the Covenant on the back of an ox cart. Two oxen going down the road. And they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant in a way that was unlawful. And when the cart hit a bump or something like that, and Uzzah, who was in the back of that cart, saw the ark jostle up and down, he reached forth to touch the ark and grab it and so it wouldn't fall out of the cart, and God caused him to die just like that. It was called, the place was called Perez Uzzah, the breach of Uzzah. In other words, at that point, they just kind of parked the cart and they said, we're not moving this thing. 
And David at that time did not get to bring the Ark of the Covenant into his house. Later on, it occurred to him, uh, you dummy, you got to send priests to do that. Then four Levite priests come bearing the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. Now they're shouting in trumpets, just like, you know, waiting for the rapture. Okay, I, man, I love this stuff. But anyway, the, you know what the analogy is there? There is no other means of salvation to mankind. God will not be honored by any other way other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Paul said, if anybody brings you any other gospel, let him be accursed, which the analogy would be guys bringing the Ark of the Covenant in some other way than the four. All right? Man, I, I, I could just talk about this stuff all day. Okay, this Bible is so rich. And I mentioned this verse a while ago, but I want you to see it. Ezekiel 28, 2. Son of man, send to the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. In the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Now, I want you to think about it again. If, that, if your heart is God's throne, and in Ezekiel 14, God showed Ezekiel that the men of Israel had idols in their heart. What does that tell you? The man of sin, the idol shepherd, the Bible calls him sitting in the place reserved only for God. That's the defilement. That, I believe, is the abomination that maketh desolate. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the idle shepherd, sitting in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, the pericardium. All right? All right, so, so far we have... We're looking at the temple of God in heaven. We see the throne. We see the four living creatures. We see the sea of glass. So we know that the heart is the throne of God. The four chambers represent the four living creatures, the four base pairs, the four gospels, the four Levite priests. That's what gives life to the whole thing. And we know that the pericardium is the sea of glass. All right? So let's go back to Revelation 4, find out what else John saw, and then we're going to look at the body and see the analogy. I'm going to show you something I've never really showed people before. You're going to like this, all right? Revelation 4, 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. I want you to notice where the human voice box is. And how does the voice operate? It's at the base of the larynx. It's just sort of right here, neck, right close to your lungs and to your heart. And how does that operate? Can you just rub your voice box together, make the muscles twitch with... No, we can't do that. The only thing that we can do with our voice box is loosen or tighten it as the air goes through it. And it causes the two muscles to vibrate, which give us our voice. So think about it. Right here is the voice box. John says he hears voices coming out of the temple of God. And we have a voice box in the temple of God. He also says that he sees lightnings and he hears thunder. You ever thought about this? Take a look at this. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings. You're looking at a chart or a graph or what they call an echocardiogram, an EKG. And it basically is just a sensor they put around your heart and it picks up the sounds, that you, the sounds, plural, that your heart makes. Now, some people, if you, they were to mimic a heart, they would go boom, 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 boom. That's only half true. If you take a look at this EKG, you'll note that there is one, two, three, Four distinct sounds that the heart makes. And it actually, it, you know, it makes sense. You have, when your heart pumps, you have four different chambers that are either receiving or sending blood out. And each one of those chambers makes its own distinct sound. And those doctors who are trained and who know an EKG and they know how the heart works, when they look at an EKG and they see something, one of those 
four sounds made that are not, that's not quite right. In other words, they know what it's supposed to look like. And let's say that sound number three is one, the third chamber of the heart. They then know that if that sound doesn't look right on the chart, on the graph, on the EKG, they know what chamber is causing the problem. And they, they know, okay, in this chamber right here is this problem, and that's why there's pain there, that's why there's dizziness, or whatever it is. They're able to diagnose what part of the heart because that part of the heart makes a certain sound. And when you listen to it, what does it sound like? Thunder. Sounds like thunder. And what does thunder come from? Lightning. What makes your heart muscles expand and contract? What causes that? Electricity. Anybody that's ever had paddles put to them to get their heart back in rhythm to reset it. Basically, doctors know that if they give your heart a jolt of electricity, that it stops all the awkward signals, or that's the theory, that it's going to stop all the signals and the heart can restart again. Or if a heart's not beating, they can jolt it and maybe that will get it back beating again in the normal rhythm that it's supposed to be beating in. But, but essentially, the heart is just like any of the other muscles in your body and they are expanding and contracting by way of electricity. I know this because I was electrocuted and the, I can't remember, the voltage at which the current was going through my body, my muscles were expanding and contracting at that exact same rate. That's why after I was electrocuted for like four or five days, I couldn't move my arms hardly at all because it would be just like I had been lifting weights for days and had just cramped every one of my muscles and I, they were so sore I couldn't move them. But you get it, right? Here we have the voices, the thunderings and the lightnings and that's your voice box and that's your heart making the sound of thunder as electricity causes it, lightning causes it to expand and contract. Just like what John heard. And by the way, John did not know that the human heart ran on electricity. They didn't know this 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. It's only been in the last hundred some odd years that we know what we know about how the human body works. And I'm telling you, everything that we learn and everything that we know matches this Bible 100%. So, we have the four-chamber heart. That's the four living creatures in the sea of glass. That's the pericardium. That's the throne of God. That's the thundering and the lightning and the voices. That's where we are so far. So far, everything that John sees in heaven is matched in this body. Now let's go to the next part. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Notice that you have two lungs. Again, anything that's two, right and left, is usually going to be a representation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I want you to think about this. Your lungs represent where the body receives the breath of life. Where does the breath come from? Do we have a tube that comes out of our armpits? One that comes out of our belly button? No. The air, the breath of life, it always comes from the head. Always. And by the way, it comes from... Uh, three main sources, the mouth, right nostril, left nostril, for three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, because whether I breathe in with my nose or I breathe in with my mouth, I, my, I'm a mouth breather at night. When I go to sleep, my jaw just drops open. I breathe through my mouth. But no matter whether it comes in through my nose or my mouth or both at the same time, it all ends up as one going down into the body. All right? And I like this. Take a look at your lungs. Again, 
One represents the New Testament, one represents the Old Testament. Now, there's some who say, well, you know, the Old Testament, that was for Israel, that's not for us. And the New Testament, that's only for us. And do you know that when your body takes in the breath, and the breath then in your lungs is distributed to your heart, your heart then takes that oxygen-rich blood and distributes it to the body. Did you know that your right hand is not necessarily the recipient of the breath that came in or that comes in through the right lung. Neither does your left hand only get air from the left lung. That by the time it's transferred into the bloodstream by way of uh, the brachial tubes, and we're going to see that in a minute, and goes into the heart, and the heart then puts it, you know, distributes that blood to the body. It doesn't really matter where or what lung or what nostril that breath comes from. It distributes it evenly as needed to every part of the body, period, the end. So it doesn't matter if it's this part of the body or this part of the body or way down at my feet or way up here where my fingers and my arms are, they're all the recipient of one spirit, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. You see that? Because now that we know, now that we have the mystery revealed in the New Testament, we as Bible believers can read any part of our Bible and receive, you know what that is? That's literally what I just did was called inspiration. I was bringing air into my body by breathing in. And it doesn't matter if it's Genesis, Daniel, 2 Chronicles, Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Amos, or John, or 1 Corinthians, or Hebrews. When you read your Bible, you are receiving and taking in the very breath of God into your body, and God is enriching every part of your life through that okay uh, man I like this all right now watch this this is a picture a diagram of the bronchial tubes all right notice that there is um, the main bronchial tube that comes down and it one half goes into the right lung the other half goes into the left lung Here's what I'm going to do for you. What I'm going to do is I, I was looking at this picture and I thought, you know, I see something here. So I took that, that graphic there and I turned it upside down. I want you to take a look at it. Okay? In fact, let me do this. Let me put this graphic of your bronchial system, the pipe, we call it the windpipe. Pipe comes down from your mouth and nose and then splits off and goes to your lungs. Okay? I'm going to put it up next to something that we studied here the last time we did this. It's called the menorah, the candlestick that was in the tabernacle. And remember, these uh, candlestick that, that John saw in heaven was a picture of the candlestick that was in the Moses tabernacle and they represent the seven spirits of God. I want you to look at this. When I turned it upside down and I put it next to the graphic of the seven candlesticks, the menorah, take a look at it. Look at that. Look at it. On each side of the menorah, you have one, two, three pipes. On the other side, you have one, two, three pipes, and then you have one in the middle. Take a look at the bronchial tubes. You have one in the middle, and then it goes to the left, and you have three primary tubes on one side, and it goes to the right, and you have three primary tubes on the other. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all together, which is where the seven spirits of God are in the body temple. Isn't it beautiful? And I want you to, now think about this. Because, and I'm getting happy because I know what I'm going to show you here in a minute. When you look at the seven candlesticks here, God specifically wanted them designed a certain way. He wanted a, a knop, a bud, and a flower, three sets on each of the candlesticks, one in the middle, 
We know there were 66 total, right? Just like the 66 books of your Bible, right? But think about it. A, a knop, a flower, and a bud, or a knop and a bud and a flower from an almond tree. Did you know that science, doctors, medical scientists, they call the bronchial system in your lungs, they call it the bronchial tree. Take a look at this. It looks like a tree. It is a tree. In fact, when I was looking at that, I'm going, I'm thinking about it. And it's like the Holy Ghost is pulling information that I had in my brain and saying, Mike, it does the same thing that trees do. And I went, oh, that's right. Trees with leaves perform respiration. That's what your bronchial tree does too. Because the leaves on the tree, you're going to like this. The leaves on the tree take in carbon dioxide and convert it to oxygen and blows it back out. That's what the leaves on a tree does. We take in the oxygen that the trees blew out and we send out carbon dioxide, which is what the trees take in. And they put out oxygen and we take in the oxygen, put out carbon dioxide and the trees take it in. And they, you see how it works? As long as they breathe, we breathe. As long as we breathe, they breathe. You have, the candlestick was a tree. Your bronchial tubes are a tree. And they do exactly the same thing as what a tree does. They give life. They exchange gases and they give life. You can even, when we do a close-up of the, of the bronchial tubes, you have at the end of them what's called bronchioles or alleviales. And they look like little olives, little fruits on the end of the trees. Okay? Take a look at your Bible. Psalm 1. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Proverbs 3.18. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. Proverbs 15.4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the what? Spirit. Notice how they connected those two words together. The tree of life and spirit. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. You got a tree inside of you. You've got literally, a, listen, you can't exist without the lungs. Last deer I killed, I shot it right in the lungs, which is really the best shot because it's an instant kill. That deer didn't suffer. Okay? You can't live without the lungs. They are literally the tree of life in you. The breath coming down from above going into the body to give the entire body life. And I love this. Okay, now watch this. This, I've never shown to anybody yet. This is, this is brand new. Okay, because I got to thinking one day that when Moses set up the tabernacle, God entered into it. Uh, same thing happened with Solomon. When Solomon built the temple, God made his presence known in it. Do you remember how? Watch this. Okay? Because remember, we're the temple. And when a new temple is built, the glory of the Lord appears in it. Get ready. Exodus 40, verse 17. And it came to pass in the first month in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up, and Moses reared up the tabernacle and fastened his sockets and set up the boards thereof and put in the bars thereof and reared up his pillars. And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent above upon it as the Lord commanded Moses. Now in verse 34, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Think about it. Once it was all set up, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whereas before, it wasn't there. You got that? First Kings 7. 
So was ended all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and the vessels, did he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. So in 1 Kings chapter 8, now that everything's in place, it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand and minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Again, when Solomon built his temple, got all the furniture in the right place and the priests were ready, the glory of the Lord filled the house, filled it. Okay? Just think of what happens every time God builds a temple. Okay? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, What, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Did not the Holy Ghost enter into the temple? Hang on. Acts 2, verse 1, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, and remember, these people gathered there together, they are the temple of the Lord. All right? And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a what? A rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Think about it. Here's the temple of the Lord now, his people. And on the birthday of the church, there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house. And we know what that was. That was the Spirit, the glory of the Lord entering into his people. And it filled the house. Do you know what God does every time a temple is built? He fills it with the glory of the Lord. Here's what it looks like. Wow. That is a picture of the house that God built and the very moment it's born, the glory of the Lord, a sound of a rushing mighty wind, goes in to that temple and it fills the whole house. I love, I love that. God, you are awesome. God is awesome. Amen? This Bible, this Bible's right, people. Now watch this. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. Look there. There's the four-chamber heart. There's the seven spirits of God in the bronchial tree in the two lungs of the Old and New Testament. That's where the thunderings and the lightnings and the voices are and the sea of glass clear as crystal and the four living creatures. And oh yes, they are surrounded, literally surrounded from the front to the back to the front again by these white things. And there's 24 of them exactly. I, the day I saw that, I just, I wept. I said, God, that's unbelievable. 24 ribs going, making a big circle all the way around the four-chamber heart and the seven spirits of God in the lungs. You are the temple of God. You are His dwelling place. And from the very moment you were born, when you were born, the glory of the Lord by way of air going into your lungs as a baby. And your lungs then began to operate and send that to the heart. And the heart began to fill your entire house of your body with that glory of the Lord, that precious air that every baby... What is it mom's waiting to hear as soon as she delivers the baby? She's waiting to hear that lung, that air enter into that baby's lungs. Then she knows that baby's all right. That baby's crying. That baby's got the glory of the Lord in him. Man, I love this. Now, I was thinking about this one day because I know anything like divided in half, uh, one represents New Testament, Old Testament, things like that, and they both work together. And you have 24 elders. I mean, you think about how God did this thing. He gave us 12 on this side, 12 on this side. We have the 12 tribes here. We have the 12 apostles here, all right? And when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about 
which side of my body would represent the 12 apostles of the Gentiles and the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, I remembered what um, when Joseph brought Manasseh and Ephraim to Jacob to bless, he brought Manasseh to Jacob's right hand, Ephraim to Jacob's left hand, but Jacob crossed his hands. He gave the right hand blessing to Ephraim, the left hand to Manasseh. Manasseh was the firstborn. He should have got the right hand, but he crossed it over and gave it here. And there's other types of this, but what we're dealing with is the difference between the Gentiles and Israel. Both of them got the blessing, but the Gentiles get theirs first, then uh, the Jews do even though it was offered to the Jews first. He who is last shall be first, and he who is first shall be last in the kingdom of heaven. Think of uh, uh, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was the firstborn, but Isaac was the firstborn of promise. Isaac gets the blessing. Jacob and Esau, the same thing. Rachel and Leah, same situation you have there. All right? So the right hand would be the Gentile side. Okay? The right hand blessing went to us First, so here's your graphic. The 12 apostles of the Gentile church represented by the 12 ribs on the right hand. 12 tribes of Israel represented by the 12 ribs on the left hand. Now, to ask you a question, where is your heart? It's kind of in the center. But I'm going to fix my tie here. It's kind of in the center, but it's just over to the left. Take a look at that picture. I mean, there, to, you're, there you see it there. It's kind of in the center, but it's really on the left side. I mean, I believe God loves Gentiles and Jews both, right? But you need to remember that his heart is with Israel. Take a look at this, because in the tabernacle... God instructed Moses to make a breastplate for Aaron, the high priest, to wear. I want you to look at it. Thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet, and of fine twine linen shalt thou make it. Four colors. Okay? Man, I love this. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, Twelve, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. In other words, here was this breastplate, and it was to have twelve stones laid in it, three here, or excuse me, four here, four here, and four here, or maybe three here, three here, three here, three here, something like three times four is twelve, you get it. But anyway, twelve stones, and each stone was to have inscribed in it the name of one of the tribes of Israel. And then that breastplate was put on Aaron, the high priest, for this one reason. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Let me tell you something. Jesus is the high priest. He's the one who goeth into the holy place to do the work of the Lord. And when he went into the holy place as the high priest, he had the names of the children of Israel upon his heart over here. Yeah, God loves the Gentiles. He loves us so much, He sent Jesus to die for our sins. But let me tell you something. When that Jesus was on the cross, He had the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on His heart when He said, It is finished. And I, I Listen, that doesn't bother me a bit in the world that Christ loves His own people just like he loves me, a Gentile, maybe even more. I'm not jealous. Shoot, I'm just glad that God loves me enough to send Jesus to die for me. And I, don't, I know that I receive of the richness and the fullness of the Holy Spirit whenever I read this book. 
You want to get right with God? Have a right attitude about Israel, about the Jews. Okay? Oh, yeah, they're mean, nasty, awful people. They, they are they're leaders of some of the conspiracies in the world. And they are, oh, yeah, they hate Jesus, too. I'm telling you, they hate Jesus and they hate the gospel. They have for 2,000 years. But they're God's people. And I'm going to tell you something. If God can save Israel, you're easy to save. And God can and will save Israel. All right? This is us here. This is them there. They have a place. We have a place. And we are the very dwelling place and the temple of Almighty God. And I'm glad to be able to say that I am Bethel. I am the house of God. Oh, God, keep your house clean. Somebody say amen. All right? Man, I've, I've had fun bringing this to you. This is not conspiracy stuff. This is not, you know, New World Order stuff. But, man, it is rich and it is full. Take these videos that we have and send them to people that may be on the fringe of believing or they don't know why they should believe the Bible. Maybe they'll see something they never saw. They, maybe they'll hear something they never heard in a sermon before. Maybe they'll realize, hey, wait a minute. If this book's thousands of years old and we match something they saw in heaven, maybe there's something to this book I ought to listen to. Maybe I didn't come from monkeys, right? Anyway, God bless you. I've had fun. Doing it. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. We'll take up another series next time. I have no idea what it's going to be yet, but we'll work on it. All right. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.